Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know this is uh, the most charged day of a very charged week here at the IMF, and uh, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the managing director, Kristalina uh, Georgieva, for hosting us uh, and for making time while she's sorting out the many, many issues in the global economy. Uh, and it's time well spent. Thank you for joining us in the room. We have senior policymakers, uh, leaders in private finance, the media, I would add, very welcome, uh, but note uh, that the media are here, and also joined uh, virtually online for our G30 spring uh, lecture. Uh, delighted to see so many friends and supporters. Uh, to get to the heart of the program, uh, by the way, I'm Mark Carney, I'm the chair of the G30, sorry, I forgot that. Um, but uh, to get to the heart of the program, I would now like to uh, introduce uh, the managing director, uh, again, Kristalina, it is a great honor. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and thank you for all your service. Kristalina Georgieva. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, and a very good afternoon to uh, all. I am very impressed by the caliber of people who are in this uh, uh, room, uh, but not surprised, because we would have uh, an opportunity uh, to listen to a distinguished uh, speaker uh, on a theme that could not have been more important and timely, lessons from the last two crises. Why important? Because uh, uh, we are in a more shock-prone world. We have to relentlessly learn lessons and anticipate what may be coming uh, next. Uh, we know that we have been going uh, the last three years from shock to a shock to a shock. And uh, uh, the implications uh, of those uh, shocks are quite, uh, uh, quite profound. Um, we are still wrestling with the increase in inflation and interest rates. It has led to a financial sector uh, pressures. But we also have seen the tremendous significance of actions taken since the global financial crisis, making the banking sector much more resilient, and importantly, creating the opportunity for swift action by policymakers. Uh, and that is uh, uh, what has calmed the waters. Uh, we will hear from Jason a much deeper analysis of how policies during the pandemic stack up those for, for after the global financial uh, crisis. Uh, but let me share uh, a couple of observations from, from my side. First is that in both cases, we had to deal with something that was with no template to follow, new. Uh, the global financial crisis um, worries about financial institutions that were too interconnected to fail, or the worry was too big to save. Um, we had, in both crises, uh, no place to hide. They have spread around the world, and uh, whether it's financial contagion or the virus, uh, no country was spared. And they were both sudden. No place, no space for debate to think through what we can do. We had to actually swing into action right away. This is likely to be happening again, whether it's a climate shock or another economic shock. So how do we prepare for a world of more sudden and profoundly global 
crisis we need to deal with. How do we build more agility and adaptability in policy making? How do we strengthen our capacity to work together, especially given that geopolitical winds are not quite exactly going in the right direction? From our perspective, from, from the perspective of the, of the IMF, it is paramount to be genuinely humble around our response capacity and very open-minded to lessons others have to share. And Jason obviously would do, would do that. What I just want to finish my, my opening by making a comparison in terms of how costly it is when a crisis hits to respond to it if we are not better equipped to buffer ourselves against this shock. In the case of the global financial crisis, G20 uh, went with the coordinated fiscal stimulus, it was an equivalent to 1.5% of GDP to cushion their economies. But that was just the beginning. Then we had quantitative uh, easing by central banks, using their balance sheets to further loosen financial conditions as interest rates approached zero. And then it became very difficult to reverse course uh, and we are in uh, today experiencing the implications of fairly rapid transition from low interest rates for a long time with ample uh, liquidity to much higher interest rates and much more limited uh, liquidity. Uh, consequences uh, were uh, also for emerging markets unintended uh, that the emerging markets had to, had to deal uh, with. Uh, because of the uh, fact that uh, advanced economies acting for, the, for their behalf uh, not necessarily can integrate the implications for others. We look at the pandemic, similarly, very costly. Advanced economies provided 28% of GDP in support to their people. Emerging markets, 6%. Low-income countries, 2%. <coughs> so we have an a, um, unfairness based on capacity to respond. Um, but we also had something that I want to praise. I look at Sri Muliani. Uh, uh, she, she has been on the forefront of it. What we can celebrate that is one thing we have done better that this time around is a coordinated response. We, when the pandemic hit, we were all in the fog, but we got together and the wisdom of many was better than the wisdom of one. Uh, we also, despite all these skirmishes, managed to come up with a coordinated um, uh, policy on vaccination. And uh, it has helped us to put the floor under the world economy. So I can say, we have learned from experience that acting together is better than acting alone. Can we repeat it in future crises? And uh, can we repeat it given that Russia's uh, meaningless war uh, has created geopolitical undercurrents that are affecting uh, us. Since we are here at our spring meetings, I want to finish on a positive uh, line. We just, just had our IMFC uh, meeting, a very constructive meeting, actually one in which we found mo more things to agree and do together than to be divided upon. So I am going to turn to uh, Mark, who is going to introduce uh, Jason, by saying wisdom is a precious thing built on experience. It is even more precious 
when it is shared. Thank you. Uh, brilliantly, brilliantly put, uh, particularly the last, uh, the last line and a precursor to what we're about to hear, uh, a great deal of wisdom and practice. Uh, because after all, <clears throat> Jason Furman is the Aetna professor of the practice of economic policy, both at the Kennedy School uh, and the Department of Economics uh, at Harvard. He's a senior resident at the Peterson Institute, a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Of course, he served as chair of the Council of Economic Advisors for President Obama for four years, four years plus, actually. Uh, and in that role, effectively, the, well, truly the chief economist of that administration, member of the cabinet. He was previously a member of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Clinton administration, um, a career in roles at the World Bank, at the National Economic Council, um, and just a huge range of research interests from fiscal policy, tax policy, health economics, social security, uh, domestic and international macroeconomics, um, and a member of the G30, and a member of the G30, all of that and a member of the G30, best for last. Um, he also, uh, in the spirit of practice, teaches uh, the largest course at Harvard, uh, Harvard College, uh, at Harvard full stop, actually, uh, which is Ec 10, Economics 10. Um, and um, mad women, you know, to paraphrase Keynes, mad women and men in authority are slaves to uh, some defunct economist. I wish, uh, I certainly was slave to a few, um, and I'm sure uh, some of those shortcomings might come out in uh, the review of the last few crises. Uh, I wish I had been taught uh, by Jason Furman, uh, but I'm very grateful that he is here to share his wisdom so that the current policymakers uh, can put them into practice. Jason, the floor is yours. Um, thank you for that um, terrific and generous introduction. Um, Kristalina, those remarks were terrific. I won't contradict them. I'll just repeat some of them um, and maybe add some points as well. Truly honored to be here um, giving this lecture, truly humbled to be here um, giving this lecture. When we take stock of where the global economy is right now, and I should say I'm mostly going to be talking about the advanced economies, which are in a very different position in part because of the difference in responses that you referred to. I'm happy to talk more broadly about the world and the discussion that follows. When you look at where the advanced economies are right now, in many respects, they're in an enviable position. The unemployment rate in many of them is near a decades or 50 year low. GDP has returned to pre-crisis forecasts and economies have dodged the recession they were supposed to go into quarter after quarter and continue to grow. Um, in many respects, it's not an enviable position. Inflation is high. Real wages are well below the trend that they were on. And of course, all of that is about the rearview mirror. Um, looking ahead, we don't know what's coming from the turmoil in the banking system, from the dynamics of a slowing economy, um, from the higher interest rates. I'm going to try to draw some lessons um, from the last two crises knowing full well that a lot of humility is in order because this one isn't over yet. Um, we don't know how um, the movie ends. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and it doesn't stop me from making it one of my favorite quotes that it's actually not true, is um, Chinese premier Zhou Enlai, who did not actually, when asked about the French Revolution, say, um, it's too soon to tell. But we're in a situation like that um, with the financial crisis, uh, I mean, with the COVID crisis um, right now. You can think of it with a military metaphor. We sent you know, huge number of soldiers overseas. They won some major battles. If you can get them home safely, you're maybe going to feel good about your battle plan. If they're stranded overseas, and maybe even someone else comes and invades you while they're tied down over there, maybe you're going to start to think that that plan, which looked so good when you won those first set of battles, um, wasn't such a good plan um, to begin with. I'll say at the outset my own premise, and I'll partly defend this as I go along, and I'm happy to come back and elaborate on it if there are any more questions, is that in response to the financial crisis, um, we did too little, 
As a result, um, there was an unnecessary set of suffering. Um, at this point, three years in, the unemployment rate in the United States was still 8%. The Eurozone was going into crisis, and it was going to take another many, many years to get back to where we were before the crisis. Um, and that this time we did too much, not just in hindsight, but reasonably understood looking forward um, as well. Whether the consequences of the first or the second is bigger, you know, was the first error bigger? Was the second error bigger? Not really particularly important to my argument. I think it's possible the error of too little last time was actually more consequential and problematic than too much, but I'm not sure about that. Um, regardless, making an error in one direction um, isn't a justification of the other. Um, so I want to step back and not just think about the next meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee in whatever country. Um, try to understand four questions. One, um, where did inflation forecasts go wrong? Two, sort of where did the initial policy response go wrong? Three, use those th thoughts to inform what should be done right now. Um, and then four, try to do a first draft of what might be a better way to get to something more like Goldilocks um, in the future. So let me start with the first one about um, the inflation forecasts um, being wrong. After the financial crisis, there was a lot of soul searching. What went wrong with the models? The queen asking, you know, why did nobody see it coming? Conference after conference on, do we need to rethink macroeconomics? Are all of our models wrong? Do we need a new set of models? There has been nothing resembling um, the scale and effort asking those same sets of questions about the inflation forecast this time as about the financial crisis last time. I'd argue that this error was actually probably a bigger one, or at least a less excusable one. Financial crises are, by their nature, almost often unforecastable. They might be a multiple equilibria phenomenon, where if everyone runs, you have a crisis, and if no one runs, you don't. There's a sort of efficient markets argument that if you know the stock market's going to fall tomorrow, it'll fall today, um, and you can backward induct. Not letting anyone off the hook and saying that those rethinking macro conferences were a waste of time. Um, but inflation is sort of more of a normal phenomenon. It doesn't usually just randomly come out of nowhere and go right up and randomly out of nowhere um, come way down. That isn't really how it works. Um, it should be something um, that's more predictable. And so I think more effort should go into why, as late as mid to late 2021, inflation forecasts were generally in the twos when inflation ended up being in the five, six, um, sevens. So broadly, when you look at that type of error, um, you can think of it two types of ways. One is you had the right model, but every economic model has an error term. And something happened to the error term, and that's why the model didn't forecast correctly, and there's nothing wrong um, with the model. In this case, there were a number of different error terms put forward. I'm not going to try to exhaustively go through them, but I'm going to take three that I think played a role in the discussion that are emblematic of others. Um, the first error term was COVID. Now, the awkwardness about COVID as an error term is when economies were reopening really quickly in the United States in the first half of 2021, in Europe a little bit later, um, the argument was the vaccines are surprisingly effective. That's why we're getting all of this inflation. Six months later, when inflation was still high and Delta and Omicron were surging, the argument became, turns out the vaccines aren't as effective as we thought. That's why we're getting all of this inflation. And so COVID became sort of an all-purpose excuse, whether it was going up or going down. Either one became a reason um, for more inflation. My view is the direct effect of COVID was probably disinflationary. That's what we saw in 2020. And the surge of Delta and Omicron probably lowered inflation below what it otherwise would have been. There's different uh, direction of impact on goods inflation, which it raised, and services inflation, um, which it lowered. And I'm happy to elaborate um, on this. But I think there's a variety of reasons to believe that's the case. Um, second excuse. Um, the ports just aren't working anymore, and people can't import things, so of course prices are going up. There was just endless footage of um, ships lined up 
outside the ports. Well, the issue there was the ports in the United States in 2021 were processing 19% more than they had before the pandemic in 2019. That is, as far as the records go back, the largest jump in port capacity. The issue was that people wanted to import much, much more than ever before because demand was so strong. And the ports were able to expand quite a lot. They just weren't able to expand as much as you would have liked. To do this in the way that I teach people, Mark, in Ec10, um, it's not a shift of the supply curve. A shift of the supply curve would be everyone at the ports gets sick from COVID, and so the ports can't work anymore. A, supply, a shift of the supply curve, you would predict prices go up and quantities go down. Instead, it was a shift of the demand curve. People were buying more imported things. The prediction of that is that prices go up and quantities go up. And you can think of that as if you gave everyone in the country a million dollars, you would observe a lot of problems in our ports. You would observe trucking shortages. You would observe microchip shortages. Every one of these observations is that supply and demand are disconnected, not necessarily that supply um, has gotten worse. Um, the third most common um, error term in the last year has been the Russian um, invasion of Ukraine, which I think um, the managing director described as senseless, which is one of many, many words that come to uh, mind for that invasion. Um, that did indeed raise energy costs, did indeed raise food costs, and did indeed raise headline um, inflation. So I think that is absolutely correct and really quite large, the impact it had on headline inflation. Um, the question is how much of it bled through um, to core inflation. And just as sort of a gut check on that, the last time we saw energy prices go up as much in a 12-month period um, was in the year through September 2005. At that time, core inflation was below 2%. This time, core inflation was above 5%. You go through models that quantify the pass through to core, and you get a mechanical effect. You know, airfares go up because gasoline is more expensive, but also a behavioral effect. People are spending so much money on gasoline, they can't afford to eat out, and so restaurant prices don't go up as much. And the net of that is you get maybe some pass through to core, but considerably smaller than what was popularly understood. And just as some way and gut check on that, over the last year, um, energy prices are actually down, about 5 to 10%, depending on where you look. And core inflation remains um, about 5%. If this was all about the error term on energy prices bleeding through to core, you'd think it would go away when the energy shock goes away. Now, the food shock hasn't gone away, um, so that's not you know, a definitive proof. So yes, I think there was some error term. I think that error term was larger in the gap between headline and core inflation than it was for core inflation itself. But that error term, I think, was relatively small. So now let's look at the model um, itself. And let me be really unfairly polemical about the model. I have a fiscal plan where I'm going to give every household in the country $1 million. And I hand it over to the people that run the models to estimate the impact it'll have on the economy. They calculate that it'll be 514% of GDP in fiscal stimulus. Maybe use a multiplier of 0.8, so economic growth is going to go up 412%. That'll drive the unemployment rate down to um, 0%. What will that mean for inflation? Well, the Phillips curve has a slope of 0.15. A four percentage point reduction in inflation will raise the inflation rate by 0.6 percentage point to 2.6%. That's a relatively natural application of a standard set of models to that policy. Now, how unfairly polemical um, was that example? The fiscal support we saw was, as the managing director said, in the advanced economies, about 25% of GDP, so a little bit less than the 514% um, in my example. You put, and the composition varied from country to country. If you look, the United States, a larger fraction of it was direct fiscal support, and a smaller fraction was loans and forbearance. If you look in Europe, the direct fiscal support was smaller, but if you price out the value 
of the loans and forbearance, it was higher. You still see a larger fiscal response in the United States, but the difference is a little bit smaller than some of the headline um, numbers. So 25% of GDP, what's the multiplier on that? If you use a multiplier of 0.5, that's 12.5% of GDP. That's adding quite a lot um, to the economy. How could the economy um, absorb that? Well, one possibility to absorb a shock like this without inflation, a fiscal shock like this, is that um, the multiplier is extremely low. Instead of a multiplier that we might normally use like 0.8 or 0.5 that I just used, the multiplier is 0.2. In addition, though, you need the multiplier to stay low. You need people to either spend some of their money up front, or if they don't spend it, put it into their saving and then spend 3% of it a year, you know, amortize it over the rest of time. You can't have them spend it out over a couple year period. Um, in addition to the multiplier being low, you need to assume that the economy can make just an extraordinary rebound. Um, if you look, a lot of the forecasts, and this was especially true for the United States, look at OECD forecasts of the United States, the FOMC's summary of economic projections, they were forecasting that GDP in the United States at the end of 2021 would be even higher than it was projected to be prior um, to the crisis. So how do you go from just everything in shambles from COVID to six months later, GDP being even higher than you had thought before? Um, and the magnitude higher was sort of 2 3%. It was quite large. Um, well, one possibility is you have a huge labor market recovery, which actually people weren't forecasting. Um, the second is if you look under the hood, sort of implicitly assuming just an implausibly large amount of productivity growth to bridge that gap between here's the multiplier, here's the extra output, you don't want to have inflation, you're not going to have a lot of employment, where does the output come from? So it's a magical set of um, productivity. I think the models, um, it was more that that model was wrong. So what's the solution to that? Do we need to rethink macro and have a brand new model? Do we think that this was just a one-off event, COVID, and you don't want to build a model for a one-off event? You want ones that work in general. Um, I would argue that it's a little bit less about rethinking macro and more about how we use our macro and how we use our models. Um, partly the model that was being used was one that pretty much, no matter what you did, predicted 2% inflation. Why? Because for 25 straight years, you'd had 2% inflation on a one-year-ahead horizon. And so it found whatever parameters got you um, to that result. Um, that's more statistics than it is um, economics. And we were doing something that was very out of sample. And so there was a danger of relying on that. Um, partly, it's about cross-checking within the model. The forecast people were putting down, as I said, implicitly had very large increases in productivity. Ask yourself, you know, could productivity go up that much? If it can't, what else um, will happen? But I think the most important is to really use an array of models um, and parameters. If you did, for example, what's the multiplier? Here's how much nominal GDP is going to go up. Output can't go up before more than it was going to before the crisis. How is the extra spending going to be absorbed? It's going to be absorbed by inflation. Or you said maybe expected inflation won't stay at two. Or you said maybe there's nonlinearities or speed effects. Almost every one of those goes in one direction. There was almost no way of saying, like, it's going to be less than 2.6 in my overly polemical example from before. And there are about eight reasons to think it might be higher. And so using an array of different models, which are built for different purposes, and having some sort of averaging across them, often it's just going to give you more of a spread around your central forecast. In a case like this, almost everything you have goes in one direction, um, not the other. So this brings me next to the policy response. Um, as I said, you know, there are always going to be errors when you look back. And there's a phrase that it's better to err on the side of doing too much rather than too little. Um, there's another phrase that no finance minister or central banker has ever gone to their grave thinking they did too much in response to a crisis. I hope that remains true. And you know, so I, it, I don't want to sort of be too, too ex post um, and come across as, as sort of more the wisdom 
of what happened afterwards. There was a huge amount of fog when um, COVID hit. The financial crisis had been really long and painful to get out of. And broadly speaking, when you have a rapid shock to an economy like this, one model is a financial crisis type model where you have a long, painful recovery. Another model is a natural disaster where when the hurricane goes through, GDP goes down to zero that week. And then the week after it's gone and everyone goes back to work and GDP goes back up. Which of these was the right model to use was not at all obvious um, in March of 2020 or April or May or June of 2020. I think some of the first hints that maybe it was a little bit more the natural disaster model that was applicable rather than the financial crisis were that the forecasts were that initially unemployment would rise and GDP would fall, and then over the remainder of 2020 that that would get worse. Um, instead, it got better, or I should say less bad. And so some type of error correction of things getting less bad um, should feed through to policy. And I think that's one of the things in the financial crisis, things were getting worse so much faster than you thought, that if you formed your idea of the policy response and waited two months to implement it, you were doing too little. Um, this time around, you formed your idea of the policy response, you waited two months to implement it, and you were doing um, too much. That's a natural, understandable thing. Um, and you know, I myself thought this would be a much longer and more painful discovery. So one answer is to build that error correction in. But I think several asymmetries um, crept into monetary policy, each one of which might be individually defensible, but collectively created just an enormous asymmetry um, in the response. And I'm going to describe these in the context ex explicitly of the Fed and the United States, but you see many of these um, in other countries as well. Um, the first is a shift from focusing on deviations of unemployment to shortfalls in unemployment. So if unemployment is too high, you worry, but there's no such thing as unemployment being too low. A second, which, en which entered the FOMC statement in September 2020, is that you will not lift off until you are already at maximum employment. Which taken literally says inflation could be five points above your target, you could be a few tenths away from maximum employment, but you're still not going to raise rates. A third is flexible average inflation targeting being um, asymmetric. You have to make up for any period of low inflation with temporarily high inflation, but you don't have to make up for high inflation with lower inflation. Um, a fourth asymmetry is that you don't want to proactively raise interest rates based on a forecast of the economy in the future, because we don't really trust the forecasts and believe them. You want to wait until you actually see the inflation to raise rates. But then where the asymmetry comes in is when you do actually see the inflation, then you start to trust the forecasts more, and you're willing to hold off raising rates because you're going to forecast um, that the inflation is going to go away. Um, and then the last asymmetry is speed, which is if you encounter a problem, you can cut rates really quickly. You can expand your balance sheet really quickly. Um, if you start to see inflation, you have to move gradually. Um, you don't want to you know, cut rates by five points at a meeting. You don't ever want to raise rates at five points at a meeting. Um, as I said, each one of these five has some decent arguments for the asymmetry. I'm not arguing to give up on all five of them. But um, synergistically, all five of those collectively, um, I think, put us in a bad place. Now, central banks have been very fast in catching up and correcting the error. Frankly, faster than I imagined they would be and faster than I personally was recommending. The end of, um, 20, uh, at the, sorry, at the end of 2021, I came out with a recommendation that inflation's a huge problem. No one understands how bad it is. It's all terrible. And so the Fed needs to do something dramatic. They need to raise rates by 75 basis points over the next year. Um, the Fed started doing that at every single meeting. So I think they sort of caught up very impressively. The ECB, the Bank of England was ahead of the Fed. Um, the ECB um, was a bit behind, but it's continuing a rapid um, catch-up process. Fiscal policy has actually been much less effective um, at catching up. And in a variety of ways, I think you've continued to see fiscal policy 
both adding to inflation and requiring even higher interest rates, leading to greater financial stability risks, whether that's a set of unrelated legislation in the United States or in European countries trying to provide, understandably provide relief for households who are hurt by high energy prices, but in the process doing things that probably result in other prices being higher. And one thing I never thought about when I was teaching sort of the relative role of fiscal and monetary policy in controlling inflation, I knew the you know, monetary policy makers could be more far-seeing and not overly weight the present at the expense of the future. I didn't realize that the fiscal incentives were almost precisely the opposite of what you needed, which is to say if you get a big burst of inflation, it's not like the public is clamoring for you to solve that problem by raising taxes on them, precisely the opposite. So that's the policy response. Um, where do we go from here? I think a soft landing is possible, but not probable. I think if you're going out there and forecasting a soft landing, in some ways you're making the same type of four different edge cases all have to go right assumptions that went into forecasting the lack of inflation in the first place. You're saying something that hasn't happened for is going to happen now that wages growth, which in the advanced economies is moving sideways or rising, is going to somehow reverse, that job openings, which are high everywhere, are irrelevant, that um, you know, inflation is just somehow going to come down because inflation expectations are two. You can write down a model where inflation does go back to two, but that model, and you go through each parameter in it, there are far more arguments that that parameter should be moved in a scary direction um, than moved in the opposite direction. Where are the risks right now? I'd argue that there's a better case for them to be asymmetric about be doing too little about inflation than the opposite. First of all, when you have a problem, usually you define that problem as the thing you want to err on the side of too much rather than too little. So if that was your view three years ago about output, maybe it should be your view now about inflation. But if you ask, you know, if central banks do too much, and I'm not advocating they do too much, and I'll come back and give you another lecture saying why it was obviously wrong in hindsight. Um, you know, if you do too much, I think the odds that inflation dramatically undershoots the 2% target are really quite low. I think if that happens, will the undershoot be 1.5% inflation? Maybe. Will you get 0.5 or 0% inflation? I think very, very little chance of that. And that undershoot is something that's fixable. The overshoot, might we have 4% inflation? That's not nearly as ludicrous as thinking that we'd have 0% um, inflation. Might the inflation rate be rising from there? Um, moreover, when I think of the sacrifice ratio, how much point years of unemployment you need to bring down inflation, I think there's a free part of the sacrifice ratio where you're lowering inflation to expected inflation. And there's a very costly part where you're trying to lower expected inflation itself. That second part of the sacrifice ratio could easily be a number like five, and we've seen even higher numbers than that um, in the past. What does that mean? Expected inflation goes up by half a point because you spent three, four years with higher inflation. You need an extra two and a half point years of unemployment to get rid of that. That's four million people losing their jobs who wouldn't have needed to have lost their jobs if you had been more active and more ahead of it. And it's that expected inflation and the fact that the undershoot is relatively improbable and a large overshoot is a risk that gives rise to what I think might be an asymmetry on the side of doing too much, not too little. You know, what exactly does this mean for the next meeting of the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, and the like? Um, you can follow me on Twitter, and I'll have opinions on all of that there. Um, I'll just say as a little bit of a gut check, Taylor rules are giving numbers like 6% or higher right now for interest rates. Um, interest rates are lower than 6% um, everywhere right now. I'm not saying we should turn things over to a Taylor rule. I'll come back to that. But it is a little bit of a gut check of sort of what would you normally do? We're pretty far from it. I'm inclined to grant some credit to the tightening that's going to happen automatically as a result of the credit contraction or credit crunch. I don't know how much credit to um, afford to it, so I'm happy to use whatever number the central banks come up with 
um, for that. But in general, the odds that interest rates need to go higher and stay higher for longer than is currently expected, I think there's a decent chance of that. Do they need to do that in the next month? Probably not. The end game of all of this, um, from a blank slate, I would, have, I would raise the inflation target. I think when you do an analysis of a world of lower interest rates, which the IMF thinks that we're coming back to, and I agree with them, that you'd have chosen an inflation target that was higher. Uh, my advisor, Greg Mankiw, once recommended, and he might have been joking, that the inflation target be set at 3.14159. Um, but no higher. Switching to a higher inflation target, though, is a really, really tricky thing to do. Um, if people think you switch to 3.14159 because you couldn't get inflation down any further, then they might think you're going to go to, I don't know what the next interesting number is, so I'll just do four, um, five, six. Interest rates will be higher. You'll be paying a risk premium. Expected inflation will go up. The cost of bringing it all down will be even higher. So I'd recommend if you try to shift to a higher target, do it in sort of a hawkish way. Don't talk about it now. Don't change the target until inflation is in the twos. If it's 2.99, that's OK with me. It's on sale. And when you change the target, maybe even emphasize the inflation side of the mandate more than the employment side of the mandate going forward, which a lot of countries already do. In fact, a lot of countries only have that side of the mandate. The final issue I wanted to address briefly is not the next meeting or the next year or two, but the next time that something bad happens to the economy, a financial crisis, a pandemic, a worldwide flood, locusts, or whatever it is, um, what are the lessons from the too much in the financial crisis and the too little um, this time? I confess I come from a little bit more of a left of center activist believing technocrats are really great at turning the knobs and dials. And if only I was in charge of everything, um, everything would work out great. It gave me complete latitude. Um, I have a little bit more affection for some of my more conservative friends who have a less high opinion of everyone in office than I do and a higher opinion of relying on rules not ready to turn monetary policy over to chat GPT-3 or even chat GPT-4, but to have a little bit more of a presumption that what the rule is telling you is right, that you're regularly publishing what that rule says and explaining your deviation from it, um, I have more fondness from. I used to think the whole point of deviating from rules was you're in really unexpected circumstances like the last two or three years. I think when you look back on it, the last two or three years in some ways were actually more normal and less unexpected and the rules might have been a better guide than that discretion. Um, we don't have similar rules for fiscal policy. Much less effort is put into coming up with optimal fiscal policy than optimal monetary policy. I think part of that um, isn't lack of supply by economists, but lack of demand by policymakers. Central bankers care a lot about these types of optimal control models. I've never met a member of Congress who did. but. You know, doing more of that is it, you know, here's what the output gap is, here's what the multiplier is, here's what you need to do to fill it, um, publish all of that, and developing those types of countercyclical um, fiscal rules. Given that the members of Congress aren't quite as interested in optimal control as central bankers, um, there's also another solution there, which is to expand the automatic stabilizers and have more things that happen automatically rather than require legislation, whether it's expanding unemployment insurance benefit. Um, aid to states and regions and the like. The second is that all of these rules um, do require forecasts as an input into them. They can't just be backward looking. And so doing some of what I said about the forecast, being more pluralistic, integrating across a range of models, testing the parameters um, within the models and the like would be welcome there. And in all of this being a little bit less about what's possible if everything goes right, and a little bit more about what's probable if everything goes as it likely will and not centering policy um, around the edge case. I want to say I hope I haven't um, come across as too smug in an ex post Monday morning quarterbacking um, type of way. That really hasn't been my intention. I am sure that I'm going to be giving bad advice in the future. 
Those of you who are policymakers, I'm sure you're going to be making mistakes in the future. The only people that that's not true of are people that either never make um, a recommendation or much more commonly, people who forget the recommendations that um, they made. Um, this is really, really hard to get right. Um, there will be mistakes, but I think we should and can strive to understand what went wrong the last two times, what lessons that has for the future. Um, and this was my first attempt to do that and look forward to elaborating and discussing with all of you. Thank you. OK, that was fantastic. Um, real tour de force and lots to jump in on. So I'm going to suggest to the audience here, I'm going to ask one question just while you prepare yours and just uh, try to catch my eye. And we'll take uh, 20 minutes. We're going to take five minutes or so of the reception. Uh, but the reception will still be there so we can do this um, uh, properly. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, just a quick question of uh, kind of where you end, ended up. And you touched it in various ways. Uh, but uh, economists are also slaves of uh, engineering, um, at least in optimal control. And one of the applications of that is in a really, a potentially really bad situation, uncertain situation, do you practice so-called robust control? So do you optimize policy for the worst possible outcome? Uh, and do you think there was some element of that here in the mistakes? And that kind of goes to your possible probable. So that's yeah. my question, and now I'm going to do the usual thing after I ask a question. I just ignore the answer because I'm trying to make the question. No, I'm going to be looking at the audience so that I can catch your questions. Jason, please. Great. So there is not a single thing that anyone anywhere in the world did between March of 2020 and September 2020 that I would second guess. Some of it ex post, of course. You know, this was too much, that was wrong, et cetera. But it was just an insane moment. And I think most countries, most advanced economies had the resources, did actually hope for the best and um, plan for the worst. The issue in that optimal control becomes what is it you're controlling for? Are you controlling for a recession or are you controlling for inflation? At some point, that problem needed to switch over. Um, and I'd say a lot of central banks in the second half of 2021 and the beginning of 2022 um, were adopting a policy towards inflation that could be described as hoping for the best and planning for the best. And um, that didn't work out so well. And, but yes, you do need to bring some of this. And, and yes, you are going to almost three quarters of the time make an error ex post um, in order to avoid that tail risk. The question is how big that error is and at what stage you make it and how you define the error. Brilliant. OK, um, great. First question just behind the photographer, uh, sir. And if you can just state, uh, in each case, who you are and, uh, and into the microphones so of people online. Can... Satya Das, Chair of the Digital Economist, and thank you very much, Mark. Uh, uh, Jason, I was just wondering, uh, from your very optimistic lecture, I thought, uh, that, you know, one of the things that we're sort of wrestling with is, uh, you know, the sustainable development goals are sort of humankind's promise to itself. How do we sort of get the robust capital flows that are needed to fulfill this? So we're kind of wrestling with the idea that maybe we create something like sustainable capital goals. Uh, I mean, how do we sort of get the world of private equity finance and capital finance supporting the global agenda? I would love to have your thoughts. So if the issue you were talking about was climate change, there's somebody else on the stage who could answer that about 100 times better yeah. than I could, because that is what, is it trillions of dollars trillions. that you're moving? How many? I can't remember the yes, number. We hope. Um, um, uh, uh, so I don't have any special insight into that. I'd say the, one of the things that the IMF is working on, that the types of people around this table need to work on, is stopping things moving in the other direction on the official side and the indebtedness we see in poor economies and having countries like China stepping up, joining. And the Group of 30 has had, um, I think, some very sensible recommendations in this area I'd recommend you look at. Great. OK, so uh, gentlemen with the glasses, and then after you ask your question, if you can pass to Jillian Tett in front of you. Sure, sure. Uh, Paul Sheard, uh, formerly Harvard Kennedy School. Good to see you again, Jason. One thing, Jason, that you didn't uh, really touch on is the damage that was done to labor supply by the COVID shock, you know, the great resignation. If you look at some of the data, uh, something like 5 million people that are out of the workforce that were, you know, were not in the workforce prior to that. Um, it seems to me that 
one way of looking at the inflation shock is that policymakers didn't make such a big mistake on the demand side, but their forecasting error was really on the supply side and not seeing the sort of labour supply hysteresis effect that the COVID shock did to the uh, labour force. Great. So, so Paul, first of all, I thank you for asking me a question I know the answer to. I thought you were going to ask me. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me about Japan, which I have never really understand what's happening there. Um, this one, I'd actually, I gave three excuses um, and tried to take them apart as best as I could. I think this is a fourth excuse, um, and let me apply the same treatment to it. First of all, if you look at the labor supply as in hours worked, there was less of a surprise there. Um, in Europe, employment was pretty good. In the United States, employment was below what people thought, but hours were up quite a lot. And so if you look at the shortfall in hours, um, it wasn't nearly as large as the shortfall in employment. Second, just as a matter of theory, when you have less labor supply, you also have people buying less stuff. And so there's less labor demand. And those two are roughly equal in magnitude. Now, they aren't equal in magnitude when you have unemployment insurance benefits that are larger than people were making when they were working. But then all you're saying is the issue wasn't the lack of labor supply. It was the magnitude of the fiscal transfers and the fact that the fiscal transfers went up when labor supply went down. And just to amplify on that statistically, if you look, labor force participation is just a terrible predictor of inflation. We had a huge, huge increase. If you look, ask what five years in US history did you have the biggest increases in labor supply? It was the late 1970s. Um, did that help with inflation? Of course not. Um, and so I think this is a thing that is related to the level of output. I think it has almost nothing to do with the inflation error. Great. Uh, Jillian, please. Um, yeah, Jillian, Tech Financial Times. Um, Paul does actually just ask a question I was going to ask, but I have half a question from that, which is... Not about Japan, I have. <laughs> yeah. No. But do you think that central banks need to change their models to look more at supply going forward, not just in relation to labor, but goods as well on services? And then secondly, um, in an early discussion um, about central banks and inflation, there were a number of suggestions that this could potentially threaten the political independence and credibility of central banks, these, this big mistake. Are you concerned that central banks could lose independence as a result of this big mistake? So on the first one, I mean, if the answer is should you better incorporate blank or be even worse at blank, like the answer is going to be better. Um, how important do I think the supplier was? I think it wasn't as important as people thought. I mean, the goods demand was just enormously high, a lot of that emanating from the United States, spreading around the world through exchange rates. Um, and the like. So I still think the errors were much more on the demand side and then the supply curve just being more inelastic than they thought. So I think it's less that the supply curve shifted and more what does the world look like when you're shifting along your inelastic supply curve. You're trying to demand, create, drive demand up, up, up and you can't accommodate it. So that might be the same thing as what you were saying. Um, on your second question, I, I hope not. Um, I tend to think central bank independence is really deep enough embedded um, in the bones of these countries, in their institutions, that it will survive this and survive this fine. There's a real tail risk to it that wasn't there before, of you know, populists emerging, them you know, appointing <coughs> terrible types of people, things turning over and the like. Um, and that tail risk is higher than it used to be, but I think it's still a tail risk. And, you know, I'm more worried that the United States is going to default on its debt, that it's going to take the independence away from the Federal Reserve. Okay. Um, Not that worried about it defaulting okay. on its debt. So go to the, the gentleman just behind Jillian, and then come to Axel Weber after, if I may. But sorry, and we'll have time for a couple more at the end. Sorry. Good afternoon, Brunello Ross from Rosa and Rubini Associates. Oh, uh, a question I have is if you think that the apparatus that has been put in place after the global financial crisis to avoid the repetition of what happened has, has proven fit for purpose. Uh, after all, we have seen in Switzerland potentially an inversion of the pegging, pegging order and, um, and uh, we have seen a return of the blank guarantees to deposits and so on potentially put in uh, the burden again on the shoulders of the taxpayer. So, uh, have they worked? Okay. Thank you. So, I think you want me to answer things quickly, Mark, right? No, uh, okay. question short, want... answers as long as you want. Great. It's the uh, Jason Furman lecture. Okay, so okay great. Yeah. So, I think big picture, we had an, 
huge shock from COVID. We had a huge policy shock. We had a huge increase in inflation. We had a huge increase in interest rates. The amount of stuff that's broken in the financial system, I think in some ways is smaller than what I would have told you was going to happen in 2019 right. relative to what has happened. So I think the big picture is the system actually has worked surprisingly well. I think there's some parts of the system that, frankly, I never, I, I used to take seriously the living wills, and I was saying that, and then a friend of mine called me up, and he's like, when something happens, they're not going to follow them. You should stop talking about how great the living wills were, and I stopped talking about them. Feel good about stopping that, Mark. I don't know if your tone is disagreeing. So I think some things didn't work. You yeah. know, that we designed regulations a little bit about worrying about things like credit risk and liquidity. So what do you do? You buy long-term treasuries, which have no credit risk, no liquidity risk, but they have a interest rate risk. So, you know, does some of that need to get retuned? Um, absolutely, some things need to get fine-tuned. But I think broadly speaking, um, I feel good about the system that was put into place. And of, of course, you're going to need to, to improve it further. Thank you for saying that, Jason. I, I think, and you can, you can slip in the bit about the living wills every once in a while. I think what's underappreciated is the greater degrees of freedom that authorities had because some of these things existed. So if you don't fully use them, you use a number of components. And Bruno, even in your question, of course, we can debate, obviously, the use of the hierarchy, but there were more tools to use and bail in because of the existence of that structure. Axel. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Axel Weber, uh, Center for Financial Studies, formerly UBS, formerly Bundesbank. Uh, so uh, on the, uh, I think I agree with your suggestion that the risk of uh, undershoot is very low and the damage associated to that is also low. The risk of overshoot is more likely and bigger. Say a few words on distribution aspects, because you know inflation we know hits the poorest in the economy quite well. And there's an additional issue about monetary policy in Europe that I'd like you to address as opposed to the US. Europe is a set of states with a common monetary policy, but the rest is not integrated. It will have quite a differential impact, whether you over or undershoot, on the various countries given debt and deficit dynamics. So maybe elaborate a bit on your idea why it's more costly if you overshoot, and then tell me why you then explain, uh, explain to me why you then want to raise the inflation target. <laughs> okay. okay, that was a lot of different things. I may yes. do some of them now, and we could talk about some of them later. First of all, let me just say on the distributional side, you know, if this was a science fiction convention I was addressing, I'd say we should also be using fiscal policy um, to bring down inflation. <laughs> and the fiscal monitor that the IMF has has a really nice analysis that shows the distributional incap uh, impacts at different percentiles of the distribution and how you could use fiscal policy to bring inflation down while actually helping people at the bottom um, and not hurting them. Monetary policymakers don't have any tool like that. So I think the distributional consideration says use fiscal also. Um, anyway, talk about what's best and then we can talk, see, it, we see who does it. Um, I, the second thing is I think monetary to a first approximation needs to ignore these distributional issues. You know, Depending on your values, you're going to want to raise the top tax rate or lower the top tax rate. Your values have very little to do, I think, with monetary policy because you're talking about job loss today versus job loss in the future. And even if you only have job loss in your objective function, you're going to roughly come to the same thing. Um, in terms of the differentiation within Europe, again, that's where fiscal policy comes into play. They, there's one monetary policy for 19 countries, but they do have 19 different fiscal policies. And so that's the way um, to square that circle. On the 3%, I'm reasonably convinced that from scratch, that's what I'd choose. I am not convinced whether the benefits of that are worth the, the danger of trying to shift to it. And I changed my mind on that depending on who scolded me about it most recently. So we can talk more after. Yeah, I think you were scolded there uh, by Axel, uh, sir. Thank you. Uh, Pradeep Kapoor, former ambassador of India and a few countries, and now in academics, and also executive director of the Smart Village uh, Development Framework. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this very brilliant uh, and you know very illustrative lecture. Uh, what I want to know is with the uh, you know depegging of the dollar from gold in 1971, and now the BRICS currency coming up uh, maybe in a couple of months. Uh, how will this de-dollarization process impact the global economies, and how is it being further accentuated by the Ukraine-Russia war. Great. So if, if Mark got his way, there'd be some digital currency that will overthrow I'm just, the dollar. I'm just but, an idea. Just but an but idea. he's not going to get his way. Um, I, I, the world is still very, listen, very. Listen to the hubris. 
This is hubris. This is what happens. Where his pride becomes before the fall. That's what's going to happen to the dog. Anyway, um, go ahead. <laughs> I was so nice to you, Mark. Um, so, one, the world is very dollarized. But two, the next thing I was going to say, I actually don't care that much. I think the dollar being a reserve currency confers some benefits on the United States in terms of lower um, interest rates and the like. It confers some costs in terms of a structurally appreciated exchange rate and what that does to the structure of the economy. And you, know, you can look at a nice, kind country like Australia. The Australian dollar is not the world's reserve currency, but yet it can continue to run current account deficits. It can continue to borrow cheaply. Life is just perfectly fine for the people in Australia. And so I think we'll keep this, but I actually don't care quite as much as I should if I were a finance minister. Fantastic. OK, that is, uh, I'm going to take uh, the comment that preceded your question, which is that was an absolutely brilliant lecture uh, and a brilliant Q&A. And we're very much in your debt. So thank you, Jason. Thank you all for taking the time and for uh, the policymakers in the room for your service. And go see another.